Dark Cast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Hola, my beautiful humans. This is Jasmine Castillo. And this is MW. Bringing awareness of murdered and missing indigenous women, girls, two spirits, the LGBTQ community, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Black Indigenous people of color. These are their stories. So, welcome to Hands Off, my podcast. Lakota Ray Renville was a shy teenager, so shy that when she graduated high school, she was reluctant to walk across the stage. She was a straight-laced girl who didn't smoke cigarettes, drink, or take drugs, says her sister, Waynette. But her life took a dramatic turn after she had met a man online in 2003 and moved from South Dakota to the Kansas City area. Lakota, a member of Sistin Wapatin Ayet tribe, told her sister that she had a boyfriend who had two jobs, so she didn't need to work. She kept secrets about her life. This is Lakota's story. November is Native American Heritage Month, which is often referred to as American Indian and Alaska Native Heritage Month. And for more than 30 years, our country has marked this month as a time to celebrate the culture, attainments, and traditions of Native peoples. Though Native Americans make up about 2.5% of the total U.S. population, their history and contributions are a critical importance to the nation's history. Unfortunately, most of it has been forgotten or overlooked. As a result, misconceptions and ignorance surrounding Native peoples and Native culture can lead to the perpetration of harmful, misinformed, quote-unquote, celebrations, especially surrounding the Heritage Month and the Thanksgiving holiday. November is an opportunity to grow our understanding of Native culture, traditions, and how historical traumas like colonization and genocide have impacted Native peoples throughout history and still does today. This month, it's important for each of us to remember that the entirety of our nation's history, including and especially the history of Native Americans, the systemic issues that still face today, and take supportive, uplifting actions to right historic injustices. There are so many things that are going on this week. We went to polls to vote. Canada celebrated Indigenous Veterans Day. And just this Wednesday, the Supreme Court heard arguments in Holland versus Brockine, a case manufactured to take down a 44-year-old federal law known as the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978, also acronym ICWA. If you'd like to know more about the history of our Indigenous community, please listen to episode 14 in two parts. This is just a small piece of what has been fought for human rights. What acts were passed for MMIW, which is the acronym for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, on October 10, 2020, two bills were signed into law to help address the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women in the United States. The bills which were presented to the President on September 30, 2020, follow years of advocacy by Indigenous women, tribes, and Native organizations calling for firm action to combat this human rights issue. American Indian and Alaska Native women and girls are experiencing violence at extreme and unprecedented levels on tribal lands and in Alaska Native villages. More than four in five Indigenous women have been subjected to violence, and Alaska Native women report assault rates 12 times higher than the rest of the U.S. On some reservations, Native women are 10 times more likely to be murdered now, the COVID-19 pandemic is worsening this already dangerous situation, magnifying the crisis of violence and missing and murdered Indigenous women, 
and shining a spotlight on dangerous gaps in the U.S. law and the disparities indigenous peoples face as a result of the United States' failure to adequately address their well-being for more than 200 years. The Savannah's Act, S-227, was originally introduced in 2017 by Senator Heidi Heitkamp after the horrific murder of Savannah Lafontaine Greywind, a pregnant member of the Spirit Lake tribe. Senator Lisa Murkowski reintroduced the bill in 2019, and it was passed by the Senate in March 2020. Savannah's Act clarifies federal, state, tribal, and local law enforcement responsibilities with respect to missing and murdered Native Americans. Aims to increase communication and coordination between federal, tribal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. Improves tribal access to resources and information such as federal criminal information databases needed to respond effectively to missing and murdered indigenous cases. Requires data collection related to missing and murdered indigenous people regardless of where they reside, and directs the U.S. attorneys to develop regionally appropriate guidelines for responding to missing and murdered indigenous persons. The Not Invisible Act, S-982, was introduced in April of 2019. It is intended to, quote, increase intergovernmental coordination to identify and combat violent crime within indigenous lands and of indigenous people, end quote. The act establishes a joint commission on reducing violent crimes against indigenous of local, tribal, federal stakeholders from diverse geographic areas that will make publicly available recommendations to the Departments of Interior and of Justice on best practices both departments can take to combat disappearance, murder, trafficking, and other violent crimes against Native Americans and Alaska Natives, not later than 90 days after their receipt. The Secretary of the Interior and Attorney General must each make public written responses to the recommendations. The Joint Commission is exempt from the Federal Advisory Committee Act, and a sunset provision terminates the Joint Commission two years after the date of the enactment of the Act. These new laws represent an overdue first step by the United States in responding to the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and fulfilling its, quote, federal trust responsibility to assist tribal governments in safeguarding the lives of indigenous women, end quote. Lakota Ray Renville is a South Dakota 22-year-old Zistin Wapitan Ayet tribal member born on July 6, 1983 to Julie Keeble Watts. She had siblings, including a sister named Waynette and a stepfather, Norman K. Watts. She was the kind of girl you would call a straight-laced girl, which means she didn't smoke cigarettes didn't drink or take drugs. But her life took a dramatic turn after she met a man online in 2003 and moved from South Dakota to the Kansas City area. Lakota told her sister that she had a boyfriend who had two jobs, so she didn't need to work. She kept secret most everything else about her life. Two years later, just at the age of 22 years old, Lakota was murdered. No one has been arrested. Police say Lakota was a prostitute who worked in Kansas City, but Waynette, her sister, believes that she was a victim of sex trafficking, a growing concern among law enforcement and activities in the Indian country. Quote, She had to be forced into the line of work. She would never, ever do that. End quote. Lakota's cause of death was brutal, and very little information was available. However, she may have been forced into human trafficking situations, just like her sister Waynette had identified. When M.W. did a little digging into the newspapers.com on where it all began, 
It was estimated that in 2003, Lakota met a man online and moved from South Dakota to Kansas City, Missouri. The boyfriend had two jobs, so Lakota didn't have to work. Lakota did not tell her family much else about her life. On October 16, 2005, which was a Sunday, estimated time of 3 30 a.m. to 11 a.m. that day, police said that Lakota was allegedly working as a prostitute along Independence Avenue in Kansas City, Missouri, with a customer around 3 30 a.m. that morning. DNA cleared that customer of suspicion. 7 a.m., some neighbors reported seeing a quote unquote pile of trash. But thought nothing of it at the time. Some neighbors reported not seeing it at all. Around 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. that same morning, a police officer patrolling in the area saw a brown early 1990s Ford Explorer parked where Lakota is later found. Nobody was around, and the truck blocked the view. It is unknown if this vehicle had anything to do with the murder. A motorist or pedestrian, depending on the news source, says motorist, and some others say it was a walking pedestrian. Lakota's body was found in an open gravel lot in 9200 blocks of Pitcher's Road. The area is off the Blue Ridge Cutoff in Independence, Missouri. The road was isolated, but Lakota was in plain view, only about 10 yards from the road. Law enforcement arrived to investigate shortly before 11 a.m. George Parks, independent police detective, was on the scene that day. Interestingly, there was unrest about the football game playing Redskins vs. Chiefs at the Arrowhead Stadium, and there may have been protesting in the area before the game. The following day, on October 17th, the paper runs a small clip about the find. Law enforcement Had not identified her yet, but released that she was probably Hispanic, between 18 to 25 years old. By October 20th, 2005, police were treating the case as a homicide. On the 22nd of October, police go to the public and ask for help identifying the unique blanket that Lakota was wrapped in. Also, the paper releases her name, a photo of her, and a picture of the blanket. Finally, they announced that Lakota is a murder victim and that she may have been picked up near Independent and Myrtle Avenue. On October 24th, funeral services at the Tribal Community Center, Agency Village in South Dakota. Lakota was laid to rest. October 25th, the examiner runs an article, but this clip was found on Find a Grave. As part of her memorial information, because her death was still under investigation at the time. Police asked the public for information about this brown Ford Explorer with Missouri license plates from the early 1990s. By spring of 2006, the family of Lakota Ray Renville provided a tribal blessing and ceremony where her body was found. By October 3rd, 2007, which was almost two years later, Crime Stoppers puts a small section in the paper about Lakota. They say her cause of death was being beaten to death. They also say a witness saw a particular Ford Explorer model just around the area of where they found her. During this whole time, Waynette, Lakota's sister, between 2005 and 2010, Called the police every single week with no answer and no update. Almost 11 years after, on September 29, 2016, a memorial article featuring MMIW was published and they talked about Lakota Ray Renville. They add stabbing to the cause of death and they also outlined that her body had been placed in an illegal dump. A Paulson High School senior sews Renville a beautiful dress in her honor. Marita Growing Thunder wore the black dress with colorful ribbons to school in 2016 in honor of Renville. Growing Thunder participates in Save Our Sisters Project 
and knows of the violence against MMIW as she has experienced that within her own family. Even though Wayne Nett never received updates or responses of information from the police department, on January 2017, Wayne Nett actually received a call from Lakota's former boyfriend, and he denied involvement of her death. Twelve years later from the time Lakota was found, on October 2017, police put out a plea for information. By 2018, Savannah's Act is a proposed bill to address the growing epidemic that is MMIW. Lakota is mentioned often in conjunction with talks about this bill. On September 5th of 2018, the police reached out to Lakota's family. Yet around this time, the case grows cold and the family begins to lose hope. The family was quoted, we're just not the same anymore. It's agonizing not to know who did that, why they did that, end quote. By October 10th, 2020, Savannah's Act Bill is signed into law. October 15th of that same year, Fox 4KC posts that the police are still looking for help in the case. A $2,000 reward is available, and tips can be sent anonymously. Some news articles are unavailable now. However, some remnants can be found online through people who copy and paste news articles. Unfortunately, that makes the resource unreliable even if it does preserve the information. In one article, for example, it outlined how Norman Watts, the stepfather, calls Independence Police Detective Mike Johan every three months. Johan says, quote, Let's just say he brutalized this young lady, end quote, but wouldn't disclose the cause of death because of an open investigation. Now, Johan explains that Lakota was working as a prostitute along Independence Avenue in Myrtle, and 3 a.m. she was with a John who was cleared via DNA, but eight hours later she's dead? Johan also said that she was apparently killed elsewhere and placed here at this location. Now, Johan did track down her last known address and knew that she was living with a man at this location. Johan also stated that there was physical evidence with her body. Eight people who could have been involved had their samples collected, and they were all cleared. They now hope for a cold DNA hit, which may lead it to an arrest. For example, they might use the drop of blood that was not Lakota's found on the carpet padding. Based on Johan, the killer stole her cell phone. They made 50 calls, each lasting about a minute, never speaking during the call. He was quoted, I think they were random phone calls. We went and contacted each person who was called. Nobody had any idea. Police think that the killer did this to throw off investigators knowing detectives would have to follow up each call in regards to the condition of her body and how it was found. Lakota's body's condition was recognizable but wrapped in a roll of carpet padding and it was a unique blanket. Lakota's head was exposed and her body was placed on the ground in plain view. She was not wearing any clothes. Her head had a large cut across it. No official cause of death has been released, but an article by Crime Stopper said that she had been beaten to death. Later reports by other newspapers say her cause of death was beating and stabbing, and later on, her body is described as severely bruised. The blanket that Lakota was wrapped in is sometimes called a rug in the papers. It is unique in the southwestern pattern and has a large print of a skull and a deer cow with horns. DNA is available in this case, but what kind and from what has not been publicly declared? If you have any information, please call Independence Detectives at 816-325-7330 or anonymously at TIPS hotline, which is 816 474 8477. 
There is a two thousand reward being offered for information in Lakota's case, and up to twenty five thousand reward for any anonymous KCMO homicide tip that leads to an arrest. This is offered by the KC Crime Stoppers, not the police, so he can be entirely unknown. Let's seek justice for Lakota Ray Rinville. Mary Weather, whom I call M.W., blogs about true crime. Not only does she do the research, she has her own podcast called Ominously Positive Podcast. Her written work is always free to use because her goal is helping cases, and I love to give credit where credit is due. The best way you can support M.W. and these cases is to share. Thank you for listening to Hands Off My Podcast. If you are enjoying the podcast and you'd like to support the mission, I do have a Patreon membership that will help the cause and bring more detail on cases and stories from the people of color community. If you yourself has a lost loved one or a story suggestion, please don't hesitate to contact me at email handsoffmypodcast at gmail dot com. And if you are only able to support in another way, please give this podcast a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify, and continue to listen to upcoming episodes every Thursday, wherever you listen to your podcast. Dios te bendiga.